Welcome to Frank Fridays. I would like to introduce Ellie Hayworth, my Frank Friday collaborator and the founder of Hayworth Communications Consultancy. Hayworth is committed to promoting intrepid ideas in art and design, and Ellie has grown her business to command a full scope of client services, including PR, content development, business strategy, speaking engagements, events, you name it, Ellie can help you. Today, we are thrilled to be sitting down with Lance Fung, who is an independent curator and the chief curator for Fung Collaboratives, organization that conceives and realizes art exhibitions around the world. Lance advises, consults, and creates public art master plans. He has been curating large-scale public art exhibitions since closing his gallery in 2005 in New York City and to pursue his curatorial practice. Most recently, Lance has curated Illuminate Coral Gables in Florida, which has turned has be, has made a public art installation um, transformed from downtown Coral Gables. So we're really excited to be sitting with Lance today, and I will let Ellie start this interview. Amazing, thank you, Carlina and Lance. We are really, really excited to speak with you today. Um, it feels a little serendipitous. I am actually based in Coral Gables, and so I get to experience the Illuminate Coral Gables initiative quite regularly. Um, but just welcome, Lance. We're excited to have you. It's my pleasure. I'm really excited to be here. Amazing. Um, so maybe as we just kind of start our chat today, I'd love um, to hear, you are certainly a multi-hyphenate professional in the art world. Um, Carlina gave us a kind of a great synopsis of your career, but perhaps you can tell us a little bit about um, just your story, you know, starting a gallery, closing a gallery and becoming this kind of, you know, roving and very ambitious curator. Well, I think like everyone, my life started um, a little naively. So I moved from California to New York City to go to graduate school. And while I was in graduate school, I didn't want to just study the whole time. So I went and got an, a two-day internship with Mary Goodman Gallery, which resulted in me being hired. After Love working it. there for two, yeah, it was great. After working there for two years, then a friend introduced me to Holly Solomon, who then hired me to be her director many, many years ago. After running her gallery, I opened my gallery and for both galleries, I curated small exhibitions and I got the curatorial bug. And after completing a big exhibition titled The Snow Show, I decided it was really time where my calling moved uh, away from the commercial uh, side of the art world into the non-commercial. I love it. Um, you've mentioned the snow show. It would be great to hear just a little bit about this kind of evolution. Maybe we can start with speaking a bit about the snow show and just how has your company grown and evolved? Well, so my company has grown and evolved from one to like four people. <laughs> yeah. But yet we do these massive multi-million dollar projects because we need every penny to realize the art. Um, but in reality, the snow show started out naively like my career. And it started with a, a small idea, which has kept growing and growing and blossomed to this multi-million dollar project, which ultimately explored the worlds of art and architecture. So I worked with emerging mid-career and established architects and artists. Mm -hmm. I partnered them and as collaborative teams, they created the most fantastical large scale ephemeral projects that we built for them in Lapland. Um, it was a huge success. Uh, which stunned all of us. And it took all of my essence, my spirit, my blood, my money. It completely <laughs> zapped me like a vampire, but it gave me the strength to realize that I could become a proper curator. That's amazing. Um, and I think similarly, you know, Illuminate Coral Gables, which we've already spoken about just ever so briefly, um, is it's kind of an orchestration and a constellation of different, you know, thought leaders and tastemakers, as well as um, just kind of vested interests here in Miami. Maybe you can tell us a little bit for anybody who's listening to this interview, to, you know, the show is currently on view. It remains on view through March 13th, if I'm correct, Lance. Yes. <laughs> uh, great. And so, yeah, it would just be great. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the story of Illuminate Coral Gables. So decades later, after doing the snow show, um, I was hired to curate Illuminate Coral Cables. Originally, their idea was to do a long weekend slash week of 
projection, fantastic, pretty uh, wall projections so that buildings crumble. And we've seen all of these at various holiday time periods. But um, when I was hired, I said, this, this, that's great, but it's not what a curator does. And we really work with proper artists, whether emerging or established artists. So very quickly on our hiring interview, our meet and greet, I did the pivot that I wanted to do Illuminate Carl Gables as a proper exhibition of contemporary art in the public space. But we maintained the idea of light, uh, which was really what they were interested in. And again, going back to the snow show, what was so wonderful was there was this Jekyll and Hyde kind of approach. So you could walk through, you know, a Zaha Deed and Tsai Kwa Chang piece or uh, Kiki Smith and Levy's Woods piece and see it in the daytime. But at night, the special effects of lighting created a very ethereal, magical, spiritual kind of feel. And so that was sort of the other element that I added to illuminate Coral Gables so that the exhibition would be viewable in the daytime and through light mm -hmm. and technology, it would provide a different experience. And I'm happy to say that our experiment has worked. And so throughout downtown Coral Gables, there are eight projects uh, designed by 16 artists at mm -hmm. 15 sites, a super great diverse group of artists from young to established from all around the world. And ultimately the exhibition's up for free. So you can walk around, ride your bike, see it in a car, um, really do it based on your comfort zone on um, obviously pandemic, you know, sort of um, conditions. Absolutely. And as a local, I can certainly attest to the fact that the local community is really embracing it. Um, there's a really beautiful projection in the city hall that I run by quite often when I'm taking kind of my evening runs um, and the Kiki Smith installation, as well as the Antonia Wright barricades for anybody who hasn't seen them should absolutely check them out. So I think Lance, you did a spectacular job of, of kind of navigating all of the challenges and making it really special. It was a challenge working in a pandemic. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, and I think maybe this is a great question to kind of segue out of that. You know, a project like the Snow Show or Illuminate Coral Gables, as I mentioned, takes kind of an orchestration of different um, different key players. Can you tell us a little bit about how you network with um, both the private and the public sector, some of the, you know, tourist bureaus, the cities, just tell us a little bit about the kind of professional networking that goes into these projects. So and I'll give you a little history too, because I'm the oldest in the group here. So when I entered the art world, being a curator was um, definitely a position of which you were put on a pedestal. And your sole mm -hmm. job was a scholarly academic approach to the process of curating a show. And so fundraising was kept at bay, development was kept at, kept at bay, marketing, PR, and all of those sort of external um, elements of an exhibition was not your domain. It was really mm -hmm. coming up with your project and creating your show. So in recent times, there's been a great merging or actually a great dumping on the curator so that all of a sudden the curator has to multitask. So the curator of today needs to be nimble and needs to be able to almost be like an in, uh, a small business owner where you have the intellectual art historical background, mm -hmm. the vision to create a new show, the bandwidth to interact with artists, and then you need to deal with how to pack, ship, return, insure, promote, um, uh, realize, install, fundraise a project. So as one can see, I'm kind of a people person and a talker. So yeah. it comes um, innately to me. And also it did not um, hurt that I came from the commercial sector. So also during my generation, you did not make the leap from commercial world to non-commercial. It was a barrier that was not penetrable. Mm -hmm. And I just did it kind of naively because I was innocent, which was great. And I made that leap. Nowadays, I think anyone entering the curatorial field needs to be prepared to come up with a good show, know how to articulate it in writing and verbally, and also know how to present it properly. Old school curators would be very dry. It'd be like working with a librarian and is very mm -hmm. academic and, and um, uh, scholarly. Now a curator needs to add some energy into the conversation, but also if you do a dry exhibition, quite frankly, I'll probably be bored looking at it. So like an artist, if you're not connected to your work, you're not going to get people interested in it. So yes, for Illuminate, it required a lot of navigation, which I love. So I'm working with 
Miami-Dade County Public Schools for Illuminate, over 300,000 children will be involved in our educational program. To me, that's an audience that's untapped, right? And then we worked with Greater Miami Visitor Convention Bureau, all the people that come into mm -hmm. uh, South Florida. Um, so we worked with them to kind of help co-promote it because why do a public art exhibition that's free and have no one see it, right? So anyone coming into town, come and see your show or better yet, plan to come and see our show and fly in. And so the, the most grueling part of Illuminate was the fundraising. We were on a big roll when we were, um, when I was curating and fundraising before the pandemic. And then as we all know, without explanation, the world came to a stop. And so um, the task of um, uh, reducing the exhibition to what was right, but not you know a hollow version of the original mm -hmm. idea and then raising the funds to realize it was a Herculean task. Um, but it's part of the job and you just do it. The one thing I have learned and the advice I'd give to anyone in that situation um, or someone younger is the minute you feel your project is being compromised, you need to pull out, you need to stop. The minute you feel anyone is taking advantage of you or violating you or abusing or exploiting your gift, your skill, your time, you mm -hmm. need to know how to stand up for yourself. None of that took place with Illuminate Coral Gables, but for many of my other big successes, they did. And I was too young to um, understand the warning signs. Um, and that's something I, I always try to teach my students, stand up for yourself, know your boundaries and do great work that's passionate. Absolutely, no, I think those are certainly you know, key best practices to kind of keep at the heart of all of your work um, and just to continue to value, you know, what your contributions are. Um, I think there's something very interesting that precipitates from that conversation that we just had, both about kind of the networking experience as well as, um, you know, I often use the word scrappy. I know that sometimes scrappy takes on um, a negative tonality. I think scrappy is actually a very positive quality and something that can be very elegantly rendered if it's done in the right way. But I think there's something interesting about this balance of a grassroots initiative, one that you can see from the ground up. And then you also have experienced Lance working with, you know, esteemed institutions like the Venice Biennale and other major, major players in the art world. So how, you know, beyond starting something from the very, very ground up, how do you get involved with an organization like the Venice Biennale and do they take similar skill sets? Um, I think the one skill set that is required for any industry and for anyone to succeed is just authenticity, right? Yeah. And I think people seek it out. And often when I do a public lecture, everyone comes out like, oh my God, you're so passionate. Da, da, da. And I'm and, and I'm like, usually you could ring me out because I give all my energy. I mm -hmm. say my cross between Tony Robbins and Robin Williams, right? When I'm up <laughs> on stage and I kind of channel this energy. And I think that's what's infectious and that's what's hireable and that's what people are looking for. All the nitty gritty of, you know, how to do something really um, can be taught. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that drive and that confidence and security, then, you know, it, it doesn't come through the work. Um, so, however, working with the bigger institutions or the more um, glamorous kind of um, venues, it's the same work. I'm flying on an airplane in comfy pants and, and loafers. <laughs> I am eating spaghetti bolognese or club sandwich in the hotel. I land, I leave at night. I don't sleep on the plane. I arrive in the morning and from the airport without brushing my teeth or showering, I'm usually going to my first meal. Mm -hmm. It's just, you have to put in the time. Um, yeah, it's a little different. Uh, when I was invited to be the curator for the site Santa Fe Biennial, which mm -hmm. was a huge honor for me. At the time, I was the youngest curator to be invited. And I followed the likes of Rob Storr and Rosa Martinez and Dave Hickey, all these like uber, you know, famous curators. And then I, I popped in. Um, it came in with a different kind of gravitas. And mm -hmm. so um, my behavior didn't change. My language didn't change. My accessibility didn't change. But the tone of how they interacted with me changed a little. Um, but it's like a yo-yo. So when we started Illuminate Coral Gables, I was emailing 
all the powers that be in Miami begging for a meeting to say, remember me? I did fight Santa Fe back in 2008, a long time ago, but remember me? I'm doing this new thing in case they didn't know who I was. And, you know, I met with some people, some people didn't have time to with, meet with me, but once a show opened, the work was out. Happily, I was so genuinely embraced by the Miami art scene. And we're like, oh my God, this is super great. Congratulations. Or can you take me on a private tour, right? So it's still about the art speaking because if Illuminate sucked, people wouldn't be coming to see the show. Sure. Um, so I think, I think work ethic is always going to be the same. Uh, and the other thing is um, when I started with that big job at Holly Solomon and I was the youngest gallery director of a sort of a top gallery, mm -hmm. I remember coming home uh, to California and I was all like full of myself and very happy and proud. And, oh, I did this, I met this. And my parents are like, that's nice. What do you want for dinner? And just completely <laughs> the humanity down. came back. Yeah. And then I was like, mom, dad, like, I just did this. I just met so-and-so. And she said, I remember my mom, when I met Elizabeth Taylor, she said, did you get her phone number? I said, no. She said, are you going to go to the movies with her? And then I said, no. And then, and then she said, well, then it's nice. You met Elizabeth Taylor, one of my favorite actors, but it doesn't change who you are. Sure. Right. So I think a key is when you, when, when your viewers are at that level of doing bigger, you know, world renowned venues, don't believe in the mythology of mm -hmm. you as a curator because they write about you that way. Like Lance Fung of the eponymous gallery did a, who did da, 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 which is great. And I'm super proud of it, but it, it hasn't changed me at all. And I will also say a little sad, but true. Right after you get that big New York Times review, which of course I'm waiting for and dying for, and it's great and everyone sees it. Everyone gets it the next day. It is lining the bird cages, right? And the <laughs> art world will say, what are you doing next? I'm like, my show's up still, you know? Uh, and so it's just, it, I guess that's great. The art world keeps you humble. Because if, if, if you believe in yourself and you're not humble, mm, who wants to work with someone like that? No, and I think it kind of keeps, you know, it keeps the that zeal moving because you continue to kind of set the bar higher and, yeah. you know, you can continue to get innovative. You may sharpen your teeth in certain areas of, or your toolkit in certain areas of your practice, but there's still growth that needs to be had in other areas. So I think that's very refreshing to hear, Lance. And as someone who, you know, is relatively, I would say I'm quite secure in my career, but I'm still very much at the beginning of what I hope will be a long career in the arts, hearing that we can continue to evolve, but we always maintain our humanity is something that I find very refreshing. Okay, great. Yes. I'll, I'll give another little piece of advice. I've retired twice, retired twice from the art world. I was so <laughs> baked. I was like, this is bullshit and I'm tired of this and blah, 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 blah. And I just, I just retreated and I had no intentions of coming back and then work found me and brought me out of retirement. And that's when I knew I needed to work again. Um, and right now I have no interest in retiring. I hope work continues to come, curatory work continues to come my way. And, I, and I'm very happy, but I also know that my life and happiness is not solely dependent on my work. <clears throat> and the other thing is I only, I'm fortunate enough now to only take projects that I want to take. Oh, that is a wonderful luxury. benefit. Yes, it is. is indeed. It is indeed. And I think Lance, this is perhaps a great segue. Um, we were speaking a little bit before we hopped into our kind of recording um, about how your kind of professional landscape or your your really your work life has shifted with the transition to remote work. Um, can you tell us a little bit about just what a remote work day looks like for you and also some of the roles that you've taken on? Sure, so about four years ago, <clears throat> I decided through a friend to start teaching. <clears throat> and I began teaching, I think one or two courses at San Jose State University here in Northern California. Um, and now it's grown to two to three classes a semester. And it really was sort of an effort to give back. One doesn't go into teaching for the salary. One can't survive on a teaching salary, quite honestly. Um, so I entered the field um, with different reasons. I have gotten back the same, if not more, from my energy teaching. I love my students. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they love me, but I love them. I'm challenged. I imagine they do. Um, 
they learn a lot of stuff because they tell them all the real shit without like being all professorial. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is really great yin yang. Um, and it's so rewarding. Um, I'm gonna sort of skip and I'll come back to your question. <clears throat> but for Illuminate Coral Gables, um, and it's part of your answer. Um, we had to work remotely. So the show, I started curating it by traveling, studio visits, and it all shifted to, I've never, well, who would imagine curating, building the show and re realizing the show almost entirely on Zoom. So the one benefit was um, in working with uh, Kiki Smith or Tsaikwa Chang or all of the other artists, they had time because no one was traveling mm -hmm. either. Kiki and I Zoomed weekly for one to two hours um, a week. And it would be robust conversations about the work, the philosophy, the audience, the materiality, um, fabrication, our garden, our dog, our home renovation, yeah. like everything, recipes, yeah. you know, it was great. And we were friends before, but like it took it to another level. But we didn't know how to realize your work and we couldn't realize it with her foundry, you know, because she and I needed to oversee it. So in the end, one of my students, who just had graduated, had all these lectures on Kiki Smith one day, is Zooming with Kiki Smith the next day, creating the prototype. And then Steve Della Carpini became the sole fabricator of Kiki Smith's entire work, which is one of my favorites in Illuminate Coral Gables. That's amazing. Our other volunteer intern from um, Philadelphia, when we did a big project in Atlantic City called Atlantic, years ago talked about augmented reality and i thought oh okay i can't do with it i can't even like post a facebook post right with <laughs> ar and then we thought why don't we do for each of the 42 animal constellations by kiki augmented reality so we go back and we call her former intern he gets hired to do the whole um augmented reality component uh, an artist friend of mine became the graphic designer to do the entire free downloadable coloring book that we've done for Kiki Smith. Um, and then lastly, my other undergrad graduate last month, right, um, became our web designer and did a huge, robust Illuminate Crow Cables website. Um, the website's so, a fantastic resource, by the way, Lance. Yeah, I think she did a great job. She's my next Zoom. But to answer your <laughs> earlier awesome. question, I know, I know I digress. Um, but definitely, you know, we've all had to change our, our work behavior. And so I'm usually sitting right where I'm sitting and I'm doing a gazillion emails a day and Zooms and not traveling. And quite frankly, yes, I can't wait to get vaccinated and I can't wait for the world to return to a, a different normal, but there's mm -hmm. been a groundedness, I think that's happened. And maybe with all the art institutions struggling for audience and funding, they will maybe revisit their core mission um, and feel more compelled to do the work they do and to do it better and to do it more equitably and to do it more transparently. I love that. And I think Lance, you quite literally took my last kind of concluding question <laughs> out of out of my mouth. But I, you know, for us, we love to kind of conclude these interviews with one positive takeaway that has come out of what has been, you know, clearly a very volatile and challenging year. Um, so I mean, on that note, can you maybe just reiterate that that one sentiment? Because I think it's really important to come back to core mission. Well, I think if you truly love what you do, you'll be able to do it well and you'll be able to do it no matter what, at what cost, right? So when you are truly passionate about your, your path or your love life or your family or your home or your garden, mm -hmm you're gonna make it happen, right? No matter what adversity is thrown at you. I think Illuminate Crow Gables is a wonderful testament of that because everyone thought for sure it would tank. And in fact, when our contract was suspended because there were no funds, we said, do we keep doing it or not? And we just worked full-time artists, mm -hmm. me, my husband, who's the director of um, Fun Collaborators and Illuminate Crow Gables. We just kept working from March until April when the contract came back in because Time said, I guess, you know, the city said you can do a show, but it was all in whole. And we just worked. We just worked. And it wasn't about a paycheck. It wasn't about visibility. And then, and it resulted. So I would say to anyone, pandemic or no pandemic, don't give up. Fight the good fight. Don't get pushed around and you will get there. And the there is going to be different than where you're imagining now. I did not think I'd be doing what I'm doing now at all. I had a completely predetermined career path as a youngster and I just took the organic path. 
I love it. I think it's so refreshing. And I just have to say, it's been a personal pleasure to meet you and to speak with you and to put a face behind this beautiful illumination that I'm enjoying in my city. Literally, I mean, more times in a week than I can count. Um, so just thank you, Lance. It really, it was, it was a lovely conversation. And Carlina, thank you as always for giving me the platform to, to ask some really curious questions. This was a great interview. Thank you, Lance. And thank you, Ellie. This was just lovely. And I hope everyone enjoys listening to it as much as I did. <laughs>